Good morning. And all of you are probably thinking, man, Nathan looks a lot better than he usually does this morning. And I also kind of feel like I should be announcing someone else got hired this morning. I don't know if that's, uh, if that's my job or not. Terry, don't worry. If you're watching live, you have nothing to worry about. Um, in all seriousness, uh, Meg and I do appreciate uh, the thoughts that, uh, that you, uh, you said, John. We appreciate that. Next Sunday will be our last Sunday. Uh, and Meg and I do cover, cover your prayers as we, uh, as we begin our transition. Um, we'll be reading from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, I will be reading verses 1 through 3. Um, And it reads this way. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. got so intent on listening to him reading the scripture, I forgot to get started up here. (laughs) Well, when Terry asked me about doing this and then gave me the topic, spiritual gifts, I thought, oh, great, thanks a lot. That's a tough one. So naturally, I want to talk about war. Now, I am going to tie this into spiritual gifts. But I wanted to cover some things about war, and and I don't think any of this is going to be a surprise to anyone. Uh, You've probably heard lessons about spiritual gifts, about spiritual battle, but I want to tie these things together, maybe give you some things to think about through your daily life each and every day that helps us in this spiritual battle, and keeping in mind, of course, you already know the answer to the sermon title, The Greatest Spiritual Gift, it's love. So I'll tell you right away, no surprise at the end, your greatest spiritual gift is love. But I want to take us on a quick journey from war to using that greatest spiritual gift. And I know, even in my own mind, it seems hard sometimes to to think of how war and our spiritual warfare can be tied into love. But it really does. Think of uh, war in the Old Testament. How victory was judged. And sometimes even still today. War was judged a victorious uh, event if you killed more of your enemy than they killed of your army. Samson, being one of the judges of Israel, that was part of their job before the kings came along. The judges were to protect Israel, to make judgments, and to go to war to defeat the enemies of Israel. And Samson was one of those, and one of the more famous of the judges. I want to look at a couple of verses that talk about his victory in the things that he did. Judges 15, 16 says, Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have killed a thousand men. I would call that victorious. If you can take a jawbone of a donkey and kill a thousand people being one-handed, a one, one soul uh, soldier, th- that's pretty good. When we get to chapter 16, at the end of his life, we hopefully are familiar with the story. He was captured by the Philistines by Delilah's deception and made a prisoner of their, uh, for their entertainment. But at the end of his life, he was between those pillars And he wanted to take out as many of the Philistines as he could, kill more of the enemy and be victorious. So Samson prayed to God and said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed in his life. Now we know he'd killed at least a thousand So when he pushed those pillars over, more than a thousand people died when he destroyed that building. So victorious war to Samson and his contemporaries was kill as many of the enemy as you can. But I went in the military, this sounds really odd to say, in the last century. 
Wow, it was a long time ago. <laughs> and I went in the military to be technical. At that time, the Army, and the, I'm sure they've changed, they adapt their training as time goes along, but when I went in, depending on the job you had, they would tailor your basic training to it. Technical training, which computer systems that I was going to do, the, t the basic training was only seven weeks long. A lot less weaponry, war strategy, all that stuff. A lot more of just your very basic army rules, regulations, and physical training. Well, as fate would have it, they pulled me aside because of my test scores and wanted me to become a linguist. And in those days of discussing that, I missed my rotation into the technical basic training group. I got to the end of that and decided, no, I don't want to be a linguist. I want to stick with my technical training. And they said, well, you've missed your technical training group. You'll have to go in in an infantry and artillery basic training. And I thought, oh, great. Not only was it more intensive, but it's four weeks longer. So I went to basic training for 11 weeks. And boy, did I learn about war. More weapons, more strategy, more history. I don't, I don't know if you realize the Army taught those kind of things, but they did. And out of all the training I had in the military, there's one thing that really fascinated me. And I had wondered about it. The AR-15, AR but known in military terms, the M-16, if you've ever seen the shell, it's, the bullet's not that big. If I were going to a war under normal circumstances, I would want to have a picture in my mind, kind of like who Samson was, but with modern weapons. Now picture in your mind this scene, and you've probably mostly seen it. John Rambo standing there with two fifty caliber machine guns and all the ammo he needs, with them pointing in the air after he's wiped out all the enemy, and he's just shooting in the air, screaming, Ah! That's what I want if I'm going to battle. But the Army gives you this weapon with a bullet that's really not much bigger than a 22 rifle. I wouldn't pick a 22 rifle to go to war. The great thing that they did for me, because I'm one of those people that wants to know why. Why can I not have a bigger gun? And they told us. It's not always the point to kill your enemy. If you shoot one of those enemy in the leg, in the shoulder, even in the chest, you may not kill him, especially with this little bullet, but the velocity is really high, so it bounces around and does a lot of damage. And I know this is a little bit graphic, but it's the truth. And it does relate. They said, we don't really worry about you killing the enemy. If you wound an enemy, it takes two enemy to carry him back and medical resources and money and time the enemy becomes distracted with a wounded fellow soldier if he's dead they'll just grab his weapon and ammo and keep coming at you if he's wounded and screaming in pain they will stop and help him that's military genius it really is now I want to tell you Satan is a military genius He's not necessarily always interested in killing you spiritually. He is interested in distracting you, wounding you, and taking your focus off of where it should be. Even in our physical world, we see sometimes there's a wisdom in not killing your enemy. Satan will use every tactic he can to fight with us, to distract us, to pull our minds off of what we should be focused on. Spiritual gifts, I think, are one of those things that God has given and was present in the first century. And even in that first century, Satan twisted them a little bit to distract those Christians. Imagine those spiritual gifts they were given, and yet read what you do in 1 Corinthians. They were all hung up and disturbed and troubled about, oh, I don't have that gift, and I want that one looks better. And 
And you know, it's interesting that today it's still the same. Talk to people out in the world about spiritual gifts and it's the same thing. And you know what it was in the first century and it still is today? Tongues. I want to speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. That's what I want to do. One of the things I find fascinating is in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28, God mentions a lot of the things he has given us to help us in our spiritual warfare. And look at the, the sequence of these things given in this verse. I notice things like that, and I think they're significant. I don't think it's an accident that things are laid out the way they are in Scripture, even the sequence in which God lists things out. But listen to this verse. And notice what the very last word in the verse is. The last word, not the first one. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, help, administration, various kinds of tongues. It's, it's kind of like the last thing. Paul mentions like, eh, oh yeah, and there's tongues. But interestingly enough, the Corinthians, that was their main focus. Oh, I want to speak in tongues. And the point that Paul tries to make to those Corinthians, the point that Jesus always tried to make is it's not the gift itself that has the power. It's who gives it and the purpose of the gift. Way back in John 14 and verse 12, Jesus said something that still baffles me. It's just amazing to me because I look at the miracles he did. And then the things that the apostles did and the early Christians did. And yet listen to what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Now, I don't know all the details and specifics behind that, but from understanding a great deal about what was important to Jesus, what is important to God, miracles are not the thing. That amazing transformation that takes place when someone believes in God, is immersed into Christ, somehow accesses the blood that he shed to gain the forgiveness of sin, that's the greatest thing. And Jesus says, the people sitting here can do greater works than those miracles he did. But it's because of his power and his sacrifice. One of the funny things I find in this dissertation, I guess you'd call it, that Paul writes to the Corinthians is some of the things he says, and I... I often try to read in the emotion, and, and I see humor in some of the things in Scripture, sarcasm sometimes, and, and I know it is there. Now, maybe I misread it once in a while, but I think in this case, uh, Paul was being sarcastic in a way, maybe even a little bit um, scolding to them in what he says in 1 Corinthians 14 and 18. He says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Now, I think later he, he really makes it clear he is being sarcastic because the, that's not the important thing. He's not that thankful that he speaks in tongues more than they do. The end result is better because he can teach the gospel to people. And that's the point he's trying to make. It's not the tongue that's the impressive thing. It's what you say with it. He does say, as we read in verse 1 of first thir uh, chapter 13, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, boy, people get hung up on that one. And then suddenly, you know, everybody on the face of the earth speaks in the tongues of angels. What about the tongues of men? Lots. Of, and being that the military wanted me to be a linguist, I do kind of have a knack for languages. I'm not fluent in any of them. <laughs> but I like to pick them up. And I can, uh, I can speak a few words of Japanese, Arabic, Hawaiian, Spanish, French, Italian, even a little bit of English. <laughs> but I don't know enough to do any good with any of it except the English. I can do some good with that. I could probably keep from starving to death in any of those places. That's about Oh, so don't come and speak to me in any of those languages except English because you just about uh, in two seconds will exhaust my 
uh, my vocabulary in any of those languages. I can ask for an apple in Russia. I can, you know, kind of, I can interrupt a conversation in Japanese and say, excuse me, uh, you know, th but you have to be able to do something with them. If you're just jabbering and nobody understands you and you don't understand them, it's of no use. Satan uses that, oh, I'm going to speak in tongues and, and get excited about that to distract us from what's really important, the message of the gospel. He even told the Corinthians, if there's nobody there to interpret, shut up. There's no point in jabbering in any language if someone doesn't understand you. There's no point. The point is that we need to use that love we have. What I find interesting is the gifts of the Spirit is a phrase, but to the Galatians, Paul uses the phrase fruit of the Spirit. I think that's so much more important, to bear fruit with this Spirit that we have. And he says in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is, once again, that sequence thing I think is important. Love. First thing, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The using of God's Spirit shouldn't be to our own glorification. I can speak five languages because of the Spirit giving me that power. I can do this, I can do that. It's not anything about I. For the Lord, I can do this. I can act in love. I can act in joy. I can bring peace. I can express patience on and on through that list. The fruit of the Spirit is what's so important. So what is this love? Love is very hard to understand for us especially in our Western society. This civilization that we live in has a very narrow view of what love is. It is very much tied to emotion. And, and I understand that completely. I was raised in the society and I really struggled and still do sometimes with the words of Jesus. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When I was younger, I thought, That's, it's impossible. That is not possible. How can I have a fond emotion for someone who is my enemy and pray for somebody who's bullying me and torturing me? It doesn't make sense. Until you understand God's love a little deeper, when you look at all the actions of God, and then you think of 1 John 4, 8, God is love he's love in action and there are a lot of things we would think how can that be love you know when God punished the people don't think of those sides of it but what God does for us every second of every minute of every day of every month of every year through our whole life the mysteries of gravity how does this earth stay in a ball instead of just flying apart in every molecule throughout the universe because God holds it oh there we go God holds all this together the earth is spinning about a thousand miles an hour if you try to stand on something that's going a thousand miles an hour the force should throw you away try jumping on a merry-go-round that's going really fast you will go on and off. But for some reason, the mass, the gravity, all this scientific stuff I do not understand, God holds us on the surface of this planet because of his word. There is light because long, long ago, God said, light. And it just became. God's understanding of all these things is beyond what we will ever understand. And he has enough love for us to create all those things. The air we breathe, 
the water we drink, the food we have, it's, it's unbelievable when we stop to count our blessings and really start listing all the small things we take for granted. And they all come because of the will and action and word of God. And it's because he loves us. And the deeper understanding of God's love is to realize he says at some point, while we were yet enemies, Christ died for the ungodly. We were his enemies, so he has every right to say, love your enemies, because he does and did. When we were all still his enemies, he still loved us, still provided for us the rain on the just and the unjust. We still had air to breathe, all those wonderful things that we enjoy. God is love, and that's a, it's a mysterious thing. But then we, being his children, even though we don't understand everything the Father does, we should imitate it. So we should be love. The beginning of 1 Corinthians 13 talks initially about all these miracles, but then in verse 4, he switches, and I think he hits the point. Here's the greatest spiritual gift, love. And then he goes on for a long time about it. Love is patient. Wait, it's not fond emotions. First thing he says, first thing about love, love is patient. I think if you've been in a family for any time, you'll learn. You need to have patience sometimes. And we lose it. We lose our patience. But God tells us love is, love is an action. Love is patient. Love is kind, is not jealous, does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. So there's a lot of things love doesn't do, but there are a lot of things that love does do. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And then he goes on to list all these other spiritual gifts that the Corinthians were so worried about. And he says, it'll fail. It'll fail. It'll fail. It'll fail. All these things will fail. They will be done away with. They will cease. But love will not fail. And he gets to verse 13. And he says, after all the spiritual gifts are gone, but now. And he even said then to those Corinthians, here's what's really important. But now, faith, hope, love, abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. There's such wisdom in the things that God teaches us. And what we find over and over, the world is in real turmoil right now. There's a lot of trouble, a lot of terrorism, a lot of violence. Now, granted, there always has been. It's always been that way. We just haven't had the information at our hands like we do now. It's almost sad in a way because we're bombarded with all the bad news. But the answer to those things is love. The greatest spiritual gift, the one thing we should really strive to improve in our lives is love. Not seeking all those other things or not also just abandoning all those other things, but having the right balance and the right priority. Love is one of those things I think we all crave as well. We want people to love us, but we need to love in the right way and seek the right kind of love. The right kind of love is the love that God gives us and that we then in turn should give one another. I think it's fascinating that 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John talk about love over and over and over again and just how critical it is. At points it even says if you don't love your brother, you don't really love God. You might think you do, but you don't. That's, that's very telling on the kind of love that we should have. A love that should be commitment, action, far beyond emotion. 
And as I was saying, if you've been in a family, probably at some point you've had someone that you loved, but you didn't like them very much. That helps us understand love and what God really wants of us. Sometimes there's someone you may not like them very much, but you will love them and still do what's best for them, even though you don't like them very much right now. I think God has been at that point with us while we were enemies. Christ died for us. Wow, that's doing the very best thing for us. Even while, he doesn't say I didn't like you very much. We were enemies. And not that he chose to be enemies of us. We chose to be enemies to him. It's an amazing thing that God shares with us and puts before us as a goal. To love one another as I have loved you, Jesus said. Wow. The greatest spiritual gift is love. If you haven't had that touch your heart and begin to change your life, if you're not following Christ, we want to offer you an opportunity to change that today and start on that path where that love and that proper love grows within you. If there's any need you have, please share it with us and let us help you while we stand and sing together. With me I come, with a humble heart I come, bowing down.